Thanks a million, Jack, and thanks a million to Don and Dennis for joining us here today. Uh, my own name is Mary O'Connor. I'm a ruminant vet with MSD Animal Health. Recently joined from clinical practice, so I um, haven't hung up the wellies just yet. I'm still uh, in the in the transition phase. I'm like a transition cow myself. <laughs> so um, to get into it, I suppose uh, I'll just start off there by giving a few statistics, Dennis, and we might go through milk recording in Ireland. Um, and we'll just see where we're at and where we've come from. So to date, I suppose the late, the, the rec most recent figures, there's 1.6 million cows in the country, 17,000 dairy farms. Out of those numbers, what's the percentage that are milk recording and the cows that are being milk recorded? Yeah, so we've seen a, an increase over the last number of years, year on year. Um, so I suppose there's nine, just over 9,000 herds being recorded in the country, which is 52% of herds uh, in Munster. We're just doing just shy of five and a half thousand herds. Um, in cow numbers, then there's over a million cows being recorded, um, and that's I suppose in Munster we're doing five just short of five hundred and ninety thousand. So heading for we broke the, the half a million mark a couple of years ago. So we're heading for the the six hundred thousand now, and that's sixty five percent of cows nationally is is being recorded as well. So there is there is a steady increase in the number of herds and the number of cows being milk recorded. Brilliant, and I suppose in turn with that we've seen. You know, a, a probably a more control over cell count and more knowledge on cell count within herds and within the national herd. Yeah, sure, absolutely. We're going to be uh, delving into the milk recording reports shortly and and the information that can be gleaned out of them. But for sure, um, I suppose milk recording is an exercise really that that creates data and it creates lots of data about about your herd and about your cows. Um, and really, I think if tis tis all about using that data, then after that, and if you can use the data, you can really make improvements, whether it is cell count, or actually improving the performance of the herd. It brings us into the world of data analytics, and I know you talk about that a bit, Don. Um, could you give us the main benefits, say, of milk recording? What would you say to a farmer to that you really see the benefits to it? I suppose look, the, the milk recording. I suppose what it's doing is it's opening up your herd so that you can do a detailed analysis on it. Um, from the point of view of cell count, we'd select a dry cow coming down the road. We know that's in the national inventory now. It's, it's part of, we have to do it. And without information, we can't do it accurately. And I suppose with the bending coming down the road, from the point of view of the limited amount of stock that we can put on the farm, from the point of view of nitrates, carrying these cows that are unperforming is just not going to pay us. So we need some vehicle that's going to identify the cows that are not paying, and secondly, manage our cell count with the absence of antibiotic in our herd. And there are two huge opportunities and there are risks in the business. And the only thing that can do that is milk recording. Great point. It's really, really well put. And I think as well, it adds to our breeding um, capabilities and the mm. capacity we can, the cows that we should be breeding off and that we shouldn't be breeding off. Yeah, That's yeah. what it really gives a lot of information, doesn't it, Dennis? Yeah, we're, and we're really starting to see that as well now, even in the AI side of the business. Um, I suppose the national herd now is, is starting to plateau. You know, the numbers are starting to steady out mm -hmm. and people are getting more focused on not just numbers, but on breeding quality and reading, putting more thought and more effort into picking the cows to breed rather than just breeding off any cow in the herd. So going back then to milk recording and from the top, from a, her from a farm that's going to start off milk recording, what's the advice around the number of milk recordings to put in place for someone that's about to start off then? No yeah, I suppose we're talking about people starting milk recording now and haven't done it before. I, I think the first thing that we have to mention is, look, the herd has got to be freeze branded. It's a big impediment out there that people just can't identify. They find it very difficult. And the biggest impediment to milk recording is not cost. It's the hassle factor that's inside there. And the lack of easy identification of cows during milk recording is a huge impediment to it. Um, look... It's very difficult to do it. The most popular and Dennis will go through this four times a year milk recording. That's very hard to do if you want it. So I, what I would be saying to people is at least get one milk recording before you're drying off. So you know what they're like this year. So when you calve down next spring and you do a milk recording within 60 days of calving, I know how my dry cow has went. And then I can make educated decisions from then going forward. And for the veterinary surgeon looking at this, that's something that he's going to need. You know, and like, you got to get your ducks in a row for it. There's no point starting next spring. And Munster Dennis might be after that, uh, have offered this, you know, about the milk recording prior to drying off. Maybe Dennis, you might say that. Yeah, I think it's it's a great way to start. Is actually if you're starting for the first time, rather than dive in in the spring and try to do four milk recordings in the year, start the autumn before and get one milk recording done. So you'll get, as Dan said, you'll get a nice bit of information about the cell count of the cows before you dry them off. You'll also get one recording under your belt when the pressure is off, when the cows are are 
or nearly dry and there's not there's not a whole lot of pressure on. And then that'll give you the confidence then to hopefully, you know, get one done the end of the end of March or fairly early the following year. And then you're really starting to see information because you're starting to see cows that cured, cows that got new infections. Um, and even that one recording before dry off really adds hugely then to the to the to the four recordings or the five recordings you're going to do the following year. Yeah. That's a really, really good point to make. Start off small and build it up rather than trying to dive in and, yeah. and take it on board because it is overwhelming and the amount of information you get from it can be overwhelming to, to, to get through. Sorry, so, sorry Mary, yeah. just on your point about how many recordings. Yes. Four won't be fit for purpose because if you need to do one within 60 days of the cow's calving, that's the end of March. Then you're going to do one at the end of May, start of June, that's two. You're going to do one around August. And your last one must be really within 30 days of the last cow being drying off. There's no point doing that in September if I'm drying off in November. So really it's got to be five or six. And people have really got to address that, that the four times a year milk recording, which is the most popular in the climate we're going, isn't fit for purpose. Yeah. And another thing, Don, I think that feeds into that is people have the idea that they must wait till every cow is calved and they must have every cow recorded or every cow milking to do a recording. But you're missing out on so much there, then, aren't you? you know? mm. So yeah. I think to try and do that early recording, even if there's you know, 10% of the herd not calved, and equally at the back end, if you have the heifers dried off or the first lactations dried off, you can still do another recording. You mm. know? So mm. you miss out on the value if you're, if you're just going on the numbers. Yeah. And it's that 60 days um, after calving, those cows, you, know, you don't want to miss anything from that. So if you are waiting until April, May time to do your first one, you'll miss out on a cohort at the, at the start. You'll miss out. I suppose the idea of doing that early milk recording is to pick up the new infections that that are likely to have been picked up during the dry period. And if you're gone beyond 60 days, ideally you'd like to be earlier, but if you're gone beyond 60 days, you cannot really attribute those infections way back to the dry period. Yes, exactly. So yeah. um, if you want to analyse your dry period performance as regards new infections and cows cured, you need to do those early milk recordings. So with regards milk recording and how a farmer can go about signing up for it and getting in on a, on a programme of, of either four to six milk recordings or more if, if they want. How do they go about that, Dennis? Could you talk us through that? So I suppose the first thing is to contact their local milk recording organisation. And the next thing then, the people in the office, they'll go through what equipment you have on the farm. So maybe you have ICAR approved electronic meters, maybe it is a modern parlour, maybe you have jars or maybe you have your own Waikato meters. So if you have your own meters, you can go into manual milk recording and by that I mean that a technician goes out uses your meters to do the recording. So that's manual recording. If you don't have your own equipment then that's that's no problem. So we have electronic meters that we will supply. So that's called EDIY. Um, and in that scenario, um, a technician will drop off the, record, the, the meters onto the farm and then in, in time for the first couple of recordings there'll be someone there to do the recording with you and use the data handler and show you how to do it but after that if you're happy um, you can do that recording on your own that's why it's called electronic uh, DIY do it yourself and but if, if help is a problem or you know um, if you're under pressure to do it yourself we also um, provide the service of, of a helper who will come out and do the recording using our own electronic meters. Very good, very good. And um, having help with milk recording is essential, really, isn't it? To take that sting out of it with, uh, the, with the time It's huge. That it yeah, takes. Don referenced the, um, the freeze branding and cow ID mm. is absolutely oh, critical, critical because otherwise yeah. you're starting to climb, yeah. climb me up and to a health and safety issue, probably climb me up and mm. uh, trying to look at cows with hairy, with, with dirty tags yeah. and hairy ears. So uh, freeze branding is critical. And then help, because the cows still have to be milked. You know, the, the, the recording is an add-on to the milking, so you still have to milk the cows. So it is really help for cow ID, and especially if you're doing it yourself, you just have to, if it is the electronic meters you're using, you must have help someone to milk the cows and someone to do the recording. Don, I'll put this question towards you. Looking at the dry period and how to evaluate that, that dry period mm. performance, from that milk recording, we have it now within the first 60 days of calving from the cows that are eligible to have been milk recorded. What are you looking at mainly from, from that report? Just the performance part of it now, the dry period performance. Eh? Okay. <clears throat> I suppose in the in the milk recording, what I find is the last milk recording of the previous lactation tells me about the cow. The first milk recording after cow calves tells me about the operator and the housing. And I look at it... So what I look at when the cell check report comes out, I say new infection rate, high, high infected, uninfected cows. 
high rate of infected heifers, heifers that were uninfected got infected. Poor cure rate, I treated cows that should have been culled. So key decisions, key management practices just weren't adhered to a drawing off. And you miss that data, which is a huge weakness at farm level. Dennis outlined it earlier about the late first milk recording. You miss that, you're on the back foot straight away. Yeah. And like, I didn't blame the cows in any part of that. It's so the operator, the housing, the lack of management. And that's a huge tool. Because it's, it's setting up for the year. Yeah, and I suppose it, it, the data is only as good <clears> as what you put into it as well. So calving dates and dry off dates are essential as well in that puzzle to make sure that you have everything in and that you're recording your clinical case of mastitis as well for, for cows that you know, you're looking for cure rates from to make sure that they have cured up properly. Absolutely, and like the records, we'll go through that in a second. Like recording accurate dates, drawing off to give the, a fair show to every cow, yeah. you know, that you reward the cow that has the long la- stage of lactation. You record, did she get a sealer, an antibiotic in a sealer? Because you can analyze in the data. How did they do? How did my selectively cows try it off under profiles? You can look. You can do an awful lot of analysis. That's the great thing with Munster and ICBF. The data is in there and they produce in a format that we can use it. Exactly, right? because there's no way we'd be able to look at anything yeah. without... We can without feel the that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the thing they really just put it in such a usable user-friendly format for us to be able to decipher what's actually going on and you can actually tell a lot now from records without stepping foot on farm and i think don you made a point once through covid you found that really you know looking at the records and you mightn't have been on the farms or you mightn't have met these farmers it yeah. gave you a really accurate picture you were never really far off with what you were surprising uh, yeah. how accurate you'd be yeah you know of course you cannot beat go out and farm absolutely and 100%, out. Yeah, yeah. but as a guide can you imagine talking to a person with and without it it's just poles apart but totally. it's amazing and you all see this and a lot of vets see this and farmers see this and you see the trends and you see the profiles and you have an accurate culture taken and stuff but with this you can really and you see what I think it gives farmers great confidence is if you put them on the right road, they can see they're improving. Yeah. So it gives them confidence to stick at what they're at. Yeah. So as much as telling you where the problem is, is telling farmers, keep the faith, stay going, it's working, your heifers are holding, bloody blah, we've contained the level of infection. The persistent girls are there, but at least we've no new infected rate. Exactly. Like the mastitis control during lactation, the cell check. Every farmer should be looking at that in every milk recording. Yes. That's crucial. Mm-hmm. And no one's looking at it. Yeah. Stop looking at your best cows. Look at the worst of them. The good ones are no problem. They're paying their way. Yeah. It's the worst. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Yeah, no, you're spot on. And pick it up early. Yeah, you know? yeah, picking up early. And that's the next thing, early intervention, really, and acting quickly. We do have an, uh, an opportunity to cure cows during lactation, whereas without these records, it's the dry period you're looking at to hopefully get a cure from, from cows. But, you know, the, this allows us to actually act very quickly in, in certain circumstances, but the dates have to be input and everything has to be accurate up along, I suppose. So that's the, the most important thing. Um, That last milk recording before dry off, then that is within 30 days of dry off, Dennis. Ideally, yeah, yeah. ideally within yeah. Um, as practically know, or as, yeah. as close as possible. So the real peak in milk recording actually is the spring and and pre dry off so that's when the recorders that's uh, really the when lab, you see your surge. everything is the busiest yeah. yeah so i suppose everyone can't record the same day you know you talk about the 17th of march to do a recording but everyone can't record on patrick's day mm-hmm. so so you have to have that spread um really people going a bit earlier and making making use of an even earlier recording um you know will add value to that herd but and, and also i suppose take the pressure off as regards trying to get all herds milk recorded in a, in a timely fashion yeah yeah Dennis, um, you were practicing clinical vet for a long time before you, you joined Munster. You have a little, I suppose, you have a protocol as such in your head when you're going out on farm to tackle a somatic cell count issue or a mastitis issue on farm. Could yeah, you talk us I, through that? Um, yeah, I will. I suppose it is tis quite simple and uh, it is something I keep in my head. And th- the aim is to try and avoid missing things, you know, because you can... I think with cell count and mastitis, it's very easy to just start focusing on the other of the cow and forget about a lot of other things that are going on and just maybe focus on the bacteria and how to treat the bacteria. So what it is, is is the cow, the machine, the routine, the environment. So that's that's what I try to keep in my head. So if I was going out onto a farm, I'd try and have a good bit of work done on the records, looking at those patterns there that Don was talking about, 
have a fair idea is it you know is it a cell count is it a contagious problem or is it more an environmental problem um, and what's going on there what's the spread like but I suppose on farm then the cow I think you can you can concentrate on the other and actually forget about the, the health of the cow um, and I suppose a healthy cow with a good strong immune system is going to suffer less from mastitis and have better resistance to, um, to cell count we all know if you have lame cows in the farm you know they're often high cell count cows they're more likely to be high cell count cows if you have a respiratory problem you might have more cases of clinical mastitis when the immune system is down uh, similarly metabolic issues in the spring if you have milk fever um, you know the open teeth ends poor immune system more mastitis so and then body condition nutrition as well um, are, are cows being, being well fed so that's that's the cow and um, the machine then I suppose um, I'm not a milking machine technician or, or I, I don't have expertise in that area but I suppose as a vet I look at the teeth ends that's my barometer of how the machine is working um, and I think a simple thing to do actually is do a bit of teeth scoring you know and actually put on a flashlight and score 50 cows and multiply your result by two and you get a percentage of, of how many cows have, have rough teeth ends so like a, a target there is, is less than five percent of the cows with one or more rough teeth ends and then the teeth itself um, less than 10% of the cows with rough teats. So the teat ends, if you have over milking or if there's, um, the ACRs aren't working properly or if the liners haven't been changed in a long time, you know, that all leads into um, um, possible teat end damage. So that's kind of a clue that maybe all is not right with the machine or not all is not right with the routine and the way and the way cows are being milked. Um, so then obviously it is very important that the machine serviced, the liners changed on time. Um, to keep those teeth ends healthy. Um, another thing then is when you're if you're in the pit looking at people milking is is the routine, um, and it's not just I suppose what happens in the pit, but the cow floor around the parlour, um, how cows are coming into the parlour, are they nice and relaxed walking in, and if they're relaxed, they're going to let down their milk, um, so you're going to have you're going to avoid that lag phase maybe and, and vacuum on the teeth and no milk coming, which is another thing that can affect teeth and teeth ends and teeth end health. And then what's happening as regards um, the routine, are the milkers, are they wearing gloves, um, the, the post-teat uh, teat, teat spraying, is that being done properly, uh, pre-spraying, if that's been done, um, cluster dipping, all those kind of things really, to, so to look at what's, what's happening with the routine and is it, is it appropriate for what's happening in the herd as regards the, the cell count and the mastitis. And the last but then Mary I suppose is the environment, you know, um, the environment that the cows are living in. If they're out of grass, it's more it's the roadways and the state of the collecting yard. So if you have 100 cows coming in, that's 400 legs. And if they're walking through muck in a mucky passageway, there's going to be, if you went out in white pants, it wouldn't be very white mm -hmm. after after walking through it uh, with the splatter. So, and if the, that splatter is going up onto the teats before milking, you know, you're going to increase the risk of environmental mastitis, likewise coming out of the parlour. And then obviously the housing and Dan touched on that earlier on, um, the housing during the winter when the cows are in. So that's kind of my the approach I keep in my head the code the machine the routine the environment to try and I suppose it's, it's my approach to try to try avoid missing out on things you know we can so, we can so commonly get pigeonholed in in such a in an area when we're dealing with mastitis so that's, I think that's human nature and yeah. I've definitely been guilty of that lots so of times so it's a great broad yeah. overview to yeah. make sure you're taking yeah. in everything yeah um so definitely and I suppose I asked Don as a farmer to start off milk recording for the very first time. But now I want to change to the vet. If the vet is going out onto a farm for the and is trying to access these this data for the very first time, it's their they haven't done it before. Mm -hmm. How do you do it and where do you go? So ideally before you go out, if you could get the login details so I used to be if from the farmer and he'll give you that. A lot of vets should be allowed to get in there themselves, log in through their own login database, but at least get that from the farmer. And then the four reports I would look at for a start. And like what I would do from a vet's point of view is just start straight forward. And you'll build up. The more you do, the better you get and the more detail you can get into it. The cell check farm summary sheet is no brainer. That's the first one you go for. You have a fantastic synopsis of where the herd is going at. Um, the cell check problem cow report, which ranks the cows and the percentage contribution to the bull tank. That's a very good report to read. The farm summary report, which has the first calvers, second, third and fourth plus. And on the bottom of that page, you have the last 11 milk recordings and how they're going on cell count. And even those three alone mm. are fantastic. Then they're broken better in the churns where you've got your new infection, your persistent and your healthy goes. But like, if you started with those, 
you'll get a fantastic picture of what's going because the cows that are there uh, let's say on the problem cow report sheet you'll see the average cell count for last year and you'll see the cell count this year so you can see is there not a chronic cows is there young cows is there heifers you can start teasing all this through like you can see is it spreading through lactation is the dry cow an issue is it heifers is it a lack of heifers mm -hmm. you know if he's, the more the farmer has recorded, the, the stronger the vet can build his report and his data. But, like, Tim's made a good point there. Like, you go as objective as you can, but you have certain ideas in your head that it could be this and could be that. But don't be determined by it. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you have them as guides. Yeah. But yeah. don't have your mind made up before you head yeah. out there. Because yeah. you're getting caught. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. one way of getting caught. Yeah. 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 And that is it, yeah, you can get caught, can't oh, you? you? can, you, you can, can get pigeonholed yeah. down one way, you and can. down this way, yeah. and to laugh that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was something like you had said before, you know, not checking the cluster flush. Yeah. And because they had a cluster flush, you'd think, right, that's starting with that issue. Yeah. But you you know, to check, to yeah. make sure that that yeah. is yeah. actually working yeah. properly in service. Yeah. Or even walking out, and looking at everything inside the parlour, and not walking out the passage, not following mm. the cows out, yeah. how they go along, exactly. you know, and they could be walking through. Through a footpath that's there with a few months. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from that then, I suppose you're analysing trends really throughout milk recording and patterns and we're looking at what, sh what those patterns are showing us. An easy way to differentiate or a quick way to differentiate an environmental or contagious um, problem, Don, could you quickly talk through that? Yeah, like you, you, of course you have the cell check dashboard as well, like that you can yeah. dive into and that's very detailed. And so on. But like what I generally do is when you're looking down is if you're seeing first, second, thirds, Caver is relatively low and you have a lot of high cows it could be just a level of chronic cows it's not spreading through the herd if i see a lot of high cows in first second thirds it's spreading it's moving through the herds sometimes the classic one you'll see i see in some staff herds is the highest group are the oldest cows for lactation plus and the next highest group are the heifers it goes after the heifers because they're the most naive and you see the second and thirds low and you say, classic, so I'm losing the first future potential of my herd. I'm destroying the potential. Like Doreen says, genetics is potential. Management is realizing that potential. You know, and it's a great it saying. It it's is. a fantastic saying. Yeah. Yeah. And nothing like mass diet is to destroy potential. <laughs> it's a great, yeah. it's a you, great one that say, way. You lose the bounce off them. You oh, really do. Yeah. Like, and it, yeah. sure, what is it now? Would it be 2,000 euros to bring a heifer into the parlour? With, with, it's probably hitting that way. Uh, yeah. You know, with the, the way inflation has gone. The old figure was 1,500 euros done. Mm, the old yeah. tigers figure. So that's, that's right. It must be gone that's up. Right. That's right. It's gone between yeah. that and, and yeah. the two now anyway, probably. Mm. And it's so much to, to bring them to that stage and for them to be hit then with something. Exactly. You know, yeah. Yeah. In the mastitis control during the lactation, you'll often look at that as well. Like if you have a contagious bug, you'll see persistent and new infection rate both high, because like, mm -hmm. it's moving. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas like in Latin, the environmental ones, you'll see the new infection good, but a high persistent. Mm -hmm. You know, no, there's two reasons for that. It could be environmental or else that farmer is very good at containing the spread. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? He's hauled it to the high ones, you know, but it's just, they give you guides, like they give you guides. Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah. I think then the individual, the big thing about milk recording is it gives you the history of the cow, you know, so it's not just she has a high cell count, but you get to look back along at that lactation and the previous lactation. So, for example, if you have a cow, we're in, heading for the end of summer now, if she's, if she's running at, at half a million, what was she like the previous recordings and what was she like last year? And you'll often see a cow that'll be, she could have been just rumbling away there, running at half a million last year, didn't cure over the dry period, running at half a million and again, so she's... She's probably flying under the radar in that she's not a millionaire. There might be higher culprits there, but she's a real source of infection. She's a chronically infected cow, probably one quarter infected, probably Staph aureus, hasn't cured over the dry period, can't be cured, and she's just that constant source of infection for, for clean, younger cows in the herd. So I think the real value from the cow, from an individual cow, is it gives you the history. And out of that history, then, you know, that's that's where your treatment decisions come out of, or not even your treatment decisions, but your decisions full stop. Um, and I suppose the other thing is the milk recording will will tell you that the cow is high, and a great tool then done is, I think, is the is the CMT, a simple test on farm that, that um, you know, that's very effective to actually find the quarter inside in that high cow. Um, and I think that's, if you do that much and look at the history, that's, um, you can make your decision out of that then. 
that's really essential and you have the option there then when you do know the quarter to try off and try and try and keep her as clean as possible without and, and curtail her spread yeah for the rest of the lactation so i suppose the first thing is like is she worth treating and that's that's a, a valid question to ask now because if she's chronically infected yeah. the, like the reality is she shouldn't be getting antibiotics she's she's they're not going to cure her you're only contributing to um, antimicrobial resistance so as you said mary there's a live option there if if there's one quarter is actually to dry off the quarter and milk her away in three quarters if there's if there's more than one quarter really you know you're looking at drying the cow at that stage you know she shouldn't she shouldn't be milking um then if she's just recently infected so if she if you had a high uh, she was high in just the last milk recording the turnaround time now is actually very quick it's about three or four days for milk recording the results are back but if you if you go on and CMT that cow within the first week and she's still high, like that's a cow that's probably worth treating. You know she's only recently infected. Um, you know obviously she's a great candidate to do culture sensitivity. So Dan might touch and taking the sample and, and and that after a while. But um, they're great candidates for culture and sensitivity to try and identify the best the best antibiotic treatment. Uh, and then the other thing it feeds into is your routine. If you've if you've identified these high cows. What are you going to do to stop the spread? Whether it is cluster dipping, milking them last, um, disinfecting your hands if you're after, or your gloves if you're after, stripping them out. So it's all about stopping the spread and making the best treatment decision on, on the cow. They say the cup can spread it on to the next five, six, five, six quarters, isn't it? That that will be put onto with a with a staff cow. Yeah, I think the research mm. research has shown that it can it can keep spreading keep down spreading, along the yeah. line. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just bringing, coming on to culture and sensitivity, done, and the importance of taking samples for those cows and building a bank, I suppose, of, mm. of bugs that are on farms and knowing what's on your farm. It's crucial, really, to... That is... Because and often it can be a mix, but it's crucial to know what's there, really. I suppose it, it, there's two things. Number one, take them, and number two, take them right. Yeah. You know, and time and time again, we say to the farmer, have you got the sample? No, she's either treated before I cop thought of it. And I say this, I'm starting to say this to farmers, for God's sake, put the sample bottles into the box of tubes. So at least when you put your hand in, the bottle's in the way. And if you didn't take it, that means you didn't bother <laughs> wanting to take it. You can't go blaming somebody else. Just put it into the box of tubes. And I would say, you know, see, the vets can't open, but because they're sealed and stuff. But when the farmer goes in, put any six, seven sample bottles into the box of tubes. So when the sample comes in, so... Look, you're trying to find the bacteria that's in the other, not in the whole environment. And like the stuff that's growing in some of the cultures, the cow should be dead. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's the reality of it. Then how do you interpret something like exactly. that then? You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, a professional like a vet looking at this and saying, for God's sake, what significance is this? A third of all the samples I went into the regional vet lab or labs were contaminated. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a huge stat. Yeah. You know? And if we expect those people then to selectively dry off cows. Yes. So these are the people that are conscious enough to take a sample and a third of them are contaminated. You know, it just shows yeah. the amount of work we have to do and be very careful, like as farmers, you know. So, you know. And could you talk us through how to take a proper sample, Dan? I know yeah, you have a nice like, video on it. Um, I watched you know, it a couple it is, times. Um, look, sure, we're trying, to do, we're trying to get the basis. So we're pre-spraying, we're dry wiping, we're cleaning the teeth, mets, cotton wool, I find the best. No, there is the course, the medicated wipes. Um, new pair of gloves first. Huh? So if I'm milking my cows and I find a case of mastitis, you don't go taking a sample of milk with those gloves on you. Mm. Yeah. You take them off and you put a new set of gloves on when you're ready to take the sample. Yeah. You know, and if you have a drafting gate or something, I, I think personally, if a cow goes in with mastitis, you don't go near her. You draft her out, you bring her around last when you have time to deal with her. You know, you can change your gloves and all that. And I think you should be using that more. I, not farmers aren't using the technology they have to do that. Yeah, that's true. Manual drafting gate, whatever. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. But don't deal them there and then. Draft them out to last. And then you have your go up, your, 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 your new gloves, meds, cotton wool, you know the teeth, bottle in. Oh, look, you know, you, you, you just call it 45 degrees, you know, so that no, no dirt is falling off the other and coming into it, you know. And... Um, and to code date, cow number, date on it, um, freeze it, you know, until you get your sample. And you can build up a bank of data for your vets or, yeah. uh, you know, definitely I think if you're taking samples for your dry cow where there's a number of cows there, I get the vet to do it. If he's open the call and you have, if you think about it, have the four or five cows there, he or she will do it. Yeah. The best way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Like he, he or she is going to be there anyway, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take out that variation. Yeah. Yeah. We spoke after you get your milk recording results, you know, there you have your recently infected cows, your your persistently infected cows, so the orange and the red cows, 
and really the big thing is you want to take action when you get the results so find out do I need to do something with these cows and it's a great time to, to line up a few bottles and take a few samples as well so the few days after you get your results back just go through the cows CMT them you might find nothing it might have been an environmental infection that she's after self-curing brilliant if she has and you don't find anything but the cows that you do find a high quarter in they're gold to sample those cows because they're they're the bugs that are that are actually causing the problem and I have a nice slide there. I was just finding it um, while you were speaking, Don, on antimicrobial resistance in the mastitis pathogens that were sent into the regional vet labs in 2020. And, you know, it just shows the importance of actually knowing what bugs are on your farm, but also what's, what's susceptible and what's resistant. So Staph aureus, you know, only 53% of them are susceptible to all antimicrobials. That's only half. Like they, there's a form of resistance. Most of that might be to penicillin-based antibiotics in staff. We know that. But, you know, that's huge to know what your farm is actually doing. Strep uberus, um, 70% are fully susceptible. Strep dyscalactia, 38.5% fully susceptible. Um, and then E. coli, but I, I won't go into E. coli. It's more of an environmental one. Um, but it just shows, you know, that there is resistance there. There is resistance building up on farms. And it's so important to take those samples. As you said, take them correctly. And that mm. method that you gave there is a lovely, clear, concise way Make sure they're just clinically hygienic and clean. But it isn't better that's going to get. No. That's the best we have. And this is what farmers have got. Mm. And their own farm is their own little world. Like, you know, what happens in Johnny's farm? You protect your little farm and protect your resistance that's in your Mm. place. Like, Mm. you know. Yeah. 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 And hopefully with selective, that's the hope, isn't it? To dilute that resistance over time. It is. Uh, Like, the more treating you do, the more opportunity you give the bugs to to develop resistance. Mm. And the less you do... um, hopefully you'll, you'll reduce it down you'll reduce it yeah, yeah exactly yeah. as you say a dilution factor nearly mm-hmm. to that yeah. yeah just on that as well mary don spoke about it earlier on getting a poor cure rate and he actually he nailed it a lot of people think the antibiotic didn't work but often it is the cow is too chronically infected for any antibiotic to work you know so i think a lot of cows are are treated a dry off when they shouldn't when they shouldn't be getting treatment they should be going rather than getting a hail mary treatment you know that um that, that we know isn't going to work but they're getting it anyway you know very good point yeah fully agree with that what i might move over to now lads is the lifetime report uh, it's probably it's my favorite one to look at it's all visual anyway and it's the churns the tree churns the um it gives us a real good i suppose synopsis of the production in the herd the profitability that's there and the cows that are holding us back so we have our bottom 20 percent and these can be the passengers in the in the herd really and they can be the free riders they're eating the same amount as our greens they're probably just really only plugging away and there's probably a few carryovers in with those as well and they're just doing wreck really in in terms of dragging down the herd what would be your advice around looking at that report for farmers looking at it it's it's a there's huge level of data and, and value of data in it the most important takeaway points from it maybe Dennis yeah, I suppose I'll, I'll start at the top of it, Don. And, um, so the, the farm or the production summary, that it goes down through how your herd is comparing to the top 20% of milk recorded herds. So you can go down through uh, the milk kgs, the percentage fat, the percentage protein and the cell count. So that gives you a synopsis of how your herd is performing to the top 20% of herds that were milk recorded in the last two weeks. So that, that's a nice thing to look at um, at the very start. And then I suppose the, the famous churns. So that that's... And what they're looking at is the lifetime um, margin per day. So that lifetime margin per day, it's looking not just at the current lactation, but of all the lactations. If you've been recording back along um, for the last number of years, it's looking at the production of your cows for those for all those years. And each cow gets a, a cost of production depending, uh, depending on the one she calved and depending on the production in the herd. So all that calculation is done in the background to give each cow a lifetime margin per day. And what the churns are looking at then is the top 20%, those green churns, they're filled to capacity. So they're, they're your top 20% on their lifetime margin per day. So it is profitability. The bottom 20% are the bottom 20 and then you have the average in between. So just at a glance looking at those churns, what you want to see, the, the green one is always going to be full. And you want the fuller the orange and the red churn are the better. It means that the more consistent the performance is in the herd. So if you see a massive drop down to the average, so if your top twenty percent are at three euros a day, 
and you're down to 150 for your average and you're down to 20 cent maybe for the bottom you know that they're only barely covering their cost of production straight away you know that there's a massive variation in the herd uh, a massive production variation what you want to see is those churns pretty tight that you have a fairly consistent herd and all the cows are actually paying their way mighty mighty um it's a great one to be able to i suppose pull out your cows not to breed off and, oh, and to, definitely, yeah. You know, you've no right mm. really to be looking at those double reds or those triple reds. Um, no, yeah, I like, like Dennis outlined it very well there. Like, I think that's the important point for farmers to realise is that the top 20% of everyone's herd will fill the churn. So Dennis's could have different value to mine or to yeah. yours, Mary, and everything else is filled proportion to that. And there's always going to be a bottom 20%. Would you want to close to the middle 60 as possible? And exactly. if you look at the herds... That are really motoring, the gap it's like a step of a stair, it's not falling off a cliff. You know what I mean? And that's and these bottom twenty percent in an awful lot of herds are falling off a cliff. So a hundred cows oh we, we've seen it like if you take a hundred cow herd and the bottom twenty percent, there's two euros a gap of difference. And three hundred days are six hundred euros. So my twenty cows are twelve thousand euros worse off than the top twenty. Yeah. Like in anyone's language that's money. You know what I mean? And that's that's a really puts in perspective these things these girls are really costing our business and awful lot and then they're camouflage I find in years like this when milk price is strong mm-hmm. but input prices are very strong so you know the margin is still under the same relatively speaking but I think the biggest thing is when you get those bottom 20% don't breed off them second thing get rid of them and definitely if you can't get rid of all of them which you can't to be fair mm. is that if they're red on cell count and red on margin get rid of them yeah. get rid of them because they're a double cost in like into yeah, so you, you, you referenced the double red card, uh, mm. the, the triple red card. So I suppose there, there's three colours in there. One is the cell count. That comes from what we were talking about, the persistent and the recently infected. So if they're red, they're persistently infected. The next red that you'll see then, it, and it's the bottom, it's the year to date, but it's the bottom 20% on the year to date margin per day. So that's um, so just to understand that. So if they're in red there, it means they're performing poorly this year. And then if they're in red again on their lifetime, so it means that they've been performing poorly over their whole lifetime. So I suppose like a simple way of without looking at any of the figures, if you're looking at, at reds, if they're if if she's red on her lifetime and she's red year to date, it means she's a very poor performer. But then if she's red on cell count as well, like you know, the odds the cards are stacking up, you know, yeah. and her um her ticket is being booked at that stage, I would say. And the interesting thing about that as well, it's very you can see straight away if there's a group that are red in the lifetime, did something happen in the calf shed to that group, say if it's the second calvers or the third yeah. calvers, that you're seeing the majority of the red in the lifetimes, especially I suppose. Yeah. Or is there something there that that happened to them as baby calves or mm. did they get a setback along the way somewhere? Mm. The most important thing is genetics don't breed off them. Yeah, uh, just one thing on the genetics. Like, if, when you look, and that's the brilliance of the report is you look at these red cows and you move across and you look at the production sub index, mm. they're always very poor or negative. And they, a lot of thing to look at you look at these red cell cone cows, they're negative on health, so genetically they can't do it anyway. Yeah, and the other thing I would say to farmers is third calvers up if they're red as a third calver, you don't have to wait until they're 10 calvers to realize they're useless, mm. get rid of them. You know, and we'd see this 10 calver and she's read the last, you know what I mean? Get rid of them. Yeah. You know, and well, whatever you do, don't breed off them. Yeah. Don't breed them. And I, what I look at in a herd is when you look at the performance of the heifers and the heifers, if they're better than the bottom 20%, you're making progress. So if you look at the margin and the heifers and that's better than the bottom 20%, that's very arbitrary you now, but it's a bloody good guide. That means I'm breeding right. Yeah. But if, if my heifers are coming in and matching the two, bottom 20, sure, where am I going? I'm bringing stuff that's as bad as what's there already. You know, and you see that with stock bulls or not selectively breeding enough, like Dennis has said, like, and she said, really pays. And you have to do it because if we think about making that decision next spring, it's 2026 20, or 27 before we'll see it. <laughs> it's such as the Titanic. Yeah, it is. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. start the museum. Yeah. Uh, Jack, you make a lovely point about that. It's all about optimising rather than yeah. maximising. So we were chatting even beforehand here about, uh, you know, the last few years, the key word is maximising the herd and maximising nearly your facilities, walkways, uh, stocking rates and so on. But nearly doing that, you're putting pressure on everything, including the farmer. And with that, um, 
I suppose it's kind of we view certain things as a crutch then to get over uh, the mishaps maybe in labour when we are maximising so it's nearly about optimising your herd that everything's running nearly to its max in itself if that, uh, if that can make sense, makes sense yeah. definitely and I think you know we all talk about sustainability now this is our biggest sustainability guide really this this report and that we have in our hands that we can see you know the cows that are worth you it's, can you can still expand in a sustainable way based off that mm-hmm. you know just avoid yeah. your bottom 20% yeah the huge thing so the big figure the last few weeks, uh, the, the climate target came out of 25% of a reduction in agriculture. But if you look at that report and the amount of cows that are probably not paying their way down realistically inside in herds, you know, um, like there is probably low hanging fruit there that you could be just as profitable with with a few less cows. Yeah, you know? yeah. And they're, they're more carbon efficient as, as you go up the way then in that, yeah. in that report. Yeah, I think Dan, Dan touched on it there with the, with the genetics. Um, and I think what was a real brainwave for that report actually was to split, not just have the EBI there like you were talking about, Don, but we actually split it into production and fertility, so the milk sub-index and the fertility sub-index. And the amount of times you look at the poor performers and go across the way, and as you said, they have a, a low production sub-index. And what's really interesting, I find as well, is to look at your, your heifers, so your first lactations. And it's, it's almost... Uh, a barometer of how your breeding went back along were you picking the right bulls mm. were you putting the right bulls onto the right cows and if you look at those first lactations the amount of time that um, that the ones that are in red so your bottom 20% of your first lactations kind of a poor production sub-index or imbalanced an imbalanced EBI um, is it's pretty high anyway yeah, that proportion yeah, yeah. and we, we know from research I suppose that you have carried out during the springtime there with your signpost farms and the boards that you were using on those farm walks the higher the EBI I suppose the more sustainable the cows yeah. in, in every so aspect in that, terms of um, those pre-breeding walks during the spring so one of um, ICBF did a bit of analysis for, for, for the crops that we were, were doing the walks for um, and was really looking at the, the quintiles um, of the herds within those crops, so the bottom 20%, the next 20% up along, the average, and so on. So the, the, the herds divided in five by EBI. And what was absolutely came across as clear as day as EBI increased, so the, the, the difference was probably the top herds were, I forget exactly now, but there was about 100 euros of a difference anyway between the, it was the, the bottom 20% were at around 70, the top 20% were at about 170. And if you look down at those that group of herds then the metrics for, for production uh, and fertility. So as EBI increased, the percentage protein increased up along, uh, the percentage fat increased. So you'd expect that as the as EBI increases, the production sub-index is going to increase. So um, their ability to produce high, high percentage milk increased. And then the other thing is the fertility. So these as EBI went up, the fertility sub-index went up. So these cows were more fertile. Uh, the calving interval went down in these herds and the six-week calving rate, rate went up. So if you combine the two, the higher percentages uh, and the better fertility, and fertility really does drive production, the, the long days in milk off grass, um, you ended up with, with higher kilos of milk solids. So there was, there was almost 100 kilos of milk solids between the top 20% and the bottom 20%. What's a kilo of milk solids at the moment, Dan? About seven euros a kilo. About seven euros a kilo. So on a 100 cow herd, um, 100 kilos of milk scholars you're looking at 70,000 euros profit between the bottom 20% and the top 20% it's which is astonishing yeah, yeah, and it, yeah. Like, I suppose there's more of those bottom 20% now milk recording we'll say and you know they're looking at their data and they say where in God's name do I go and one thing I think those herds should do beef the whole out of your herd and buy the genetic piggyback on somebody else's 20 and 30 years of success because That's it same. just takes you too long yeah. it'll take you about where you get when you get to the, the where those fellas are in fifteen years time, they've moved on so far. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're away behind. Mm-hmm. Piggyback them, mm-hmm. pay them, pay four hundred quid, whatever the hell it is for, yeah. Frisian heifer calves or ten fifteen of them, AI'd, genotyped, dropped into the yard, and off you go yeah. and beef the whole bloody lot of them yeah. because yeah. it's just too slow and. Park your pride. Go ahead and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have lovely beef calves yeah. to sell instead of Frisian bulls. <laughs> a few years down the line when, when the, when the checks oh, started right. to arrive, yeah. it's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. You'll forget about your pride. You don't have many quickly. clients on that, but yeah. boy, God. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic genetics out there. Yeah. Absolutely. Like where, it's, where it really comes home to me is the new entrance down the last few years. Oh, I know you've and said it. The new entrants they went out and, and um, got the right advice and got the right genetics. So like they're in the top whatever, 5% of EBI now because they bought um, they bought high EBI heifers 
and they're absolutely mm-hmm. flying. They're up in the top 20 or the top 10%, um, and they're only daring with a few years, yeah. and they're already, at, they're already yeah. at the pinnacle, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah. like Great genetics, example, it's, yeah. it's there in the MAC curve. Um, the carbon index is going to be coming. For, it'll be there mm-hmm. for next year as part of the EBI. Look, we know it's already, the correlation is strong with the EBI already. But um, I think, like, we're back to what you said about Doreen earlier on, Don. Genetics creates the potential. Management realises it yeah. and disease destroys it. So yeah. the first part of the jigsaw is to try and get the genetics right. Yeah. So, Don, we know that Animal Health Ireland have, you know, brought out this year the lactation cow, cow consult, a new, a new TASA consult, whereby farmers that are probably having, I suppose we could say, problems can avail of uh, a consult with their vet, their ag advisor, their milk machine technician it's multidisciplinary approach to a problem on a farm which i think has mm-hmm. been missing for so long because you know not one of the people that i mentioned there can actually fix the whole issue it's all of us together mm-hmm. i definitely exactly, yeah. you know won't have as much to add about something <clears throat> to do with a milking machine or you know what what anyone else can bring uh, you know, we're very streamlined in our in our information that we have and it's to realize that we can only do so much and give so much information and, and ask for help when we when we have to but bringing us on to the milking machine part of things, um, I just want to kind of go through, you know, the importance of liner changes, getting your machine serviced. There has been, a, I suppose, a shortage of labour in that side of the industry, um, getting servicemen and getting machine service, and that's probably slipped back and maybe liner changes have gone past the 2,000 milkings or yeah. every six months. And it, I suppose you know, we know that when we do a liner change, it's the yield can go up by 5%, you know, and it, we're over peak now. And the milk letdown is, you know, is that little bit less. So mm-hmm. what would be your advice around, you know, servicing? And when if you can't get a serviceman in, what would, I suppose, yeah. how would you tackle that issue? Yeah, no, it's a very good point, Mary, because I'm definitely seeing out there that there's a lack of servicing of parlours through no fault mm-hmm. of anyone's. And to be fair to the technicians, and we've been pushing this to get your parlour serviced before you calf, right? And I think we should pull back from that and get it serviced during the summer because the technicians are installing parlours, they're doing extensions, and they're up to their eyeballs. It's cold, it's wet. What's put around with service it now? Mm-hmm. Long days, heat, you can get people. There's, the technicians have said three things to me, and they said, could you push for servicing during the summer? To get their liners on, get the parlour serviced. Number one, a way better weather conditions, they have long days, and number three or four, they get paid. <laughs> You know what I mean? I know that sounds bad, but like you were talking about January, February, when cash flow is tight in farm level, the technician has spent four or five grand in a parlour, and you can't get a jig. At least money is coming in, and to be fair to everyone, it's, and I think we need to start looking at that and mm-hmm. spreading the work. Like Dennis made a point, we all can't milk a cotton on Paddy's Day. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll be off to something else on Paddy's Day, but <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> so you can't get a wild service. And like, you spread it out. So if you can get it done this spring, do, but get it done. So Mary, you made a pint about 2,000 milkings. That's roughly the 1st of July. So if I have a 20 unit parlour, and I've on, if I have 200 cows, that's 10 milkings in the morning, 10 milkings in the evening, that's 20, 20 into 2,000, there's 100 days. So I should actually be changing every 100 days, give or take. Mm-hmm. So it's six months or 2,000 milkings, whichever comes first. And like, if you would, like you said, with milk letdown, you put in your new liners now, you get better milk out, cell counts hold steady right through the back end of the year. You know, because milk that don't know, the oxytocin reflex is starting to fall back a little it bit has, now, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because we don't we don't prep cows here in Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> very few of us anyway, yeah. So we have a very yeah. poor milk let down reflex. Yeah, we do, then, yeah, you know, yeah. Especially in tailing right. lactation. Yeah, yeah. And coming into this this season as well, we're in the current heat wave, it's going to be less as well. They're just under that little bit more pressure. Mm. Um to do with hot washing then, um, Don, and on to that and how often would you say farmers are hot washing or how often should they be hot washing? I look, the more complex the, the plant, yeah. especially since we're going to chlorine free now, the more complex the plant, the more hot washing. And ideally, hot wash every morning and cold in the evening. If you're using a powder based product, you can reuse it that evening if you're a manual wash. Automatic setups, you can't do that. You don't have that luxury. Yeah. But I think the biggest mis- weakness we see at farm level is number one, their dilution rates are wrong. They're not looking at the chemistry and they're not looking at the actual dilution rates that's there because they don't know the capacity of their tracks, so they don't know the dilution rates, you know. So, really, if you're buying your detergents from the co-op or however, you need to go in to say, look, I have a 200 litre track, I have 20 units, that's 10 litres per unit to wash it, which is right. What's my dilution rate for that product? Yeah. The lads should tell you. But the biggest thing is descaling. You want to be descaling twice or three times a week. Okay. You know? Yeah. 
Um, the other thing I'd just say and thank should be hot washed every collection. Just wash. Uh, one thing I keep and the bull tanks, the hot water setups are very good. So if if you hot wash a tank with more than seventy degrees, there's a risk the gas will expand and contract. So yeah. over time you could split your tank. Do you know what I mean? Just metal fatigue. So a tank can be washed at sixty degrees, no problem. Fifty five, sixty degrees, no problem. Oh, you know, it's easy to point. do. It's yeah. easy to wash a tank. It's just cylinder two ends. So yeah. you know, milking power is way more complex. Like so, we need. Like, what are the three things we have? Washing plant, temperature, titration, and turbulence. They're the three things. So, temperature we need at it, 75, 80 degrees, dump at 45. Turbulence, you need a whipping around the plant, 10 litres per unit. Look at it, washing, make sure it's whipping around the place, you know. And number three, titration, that you have the right chemical, the right concentration of the chemical. And those three, you're all right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point to make. I actually didn't realise that about about the tank and the temperature that you could bring it down a little bit to mm. avoid that metal fatigue mm. and bring me on then to cluster flushing so it's a it's another arm i suppose in the defense against cell count and trying to curtail cell count but it's probably only as good again as the management that's there yeah it's, um, it's, a, it's a definitely a help in a staff or this type of problem you know yeah. not to be all and end all and look like we said earlier as you said Mary earlier we made a mistake that if it was there we didn't look at it but you need to check and make sure there's 800 mils per litre being flushed out every time. Look, to be fair, we said the contact, the, the infected liner will spread its next six to eight cows. It mitigates against that, yeah. you know. So you're putting your paracetic acid solution going through rather than buckets. Look, it's definitely, it's definitely um, a help, big investment. Is it worth it? Yeah, I think... The, the cluster dipping can lead on to issues in itself, I suppose. It's a... Yeah, but even, I suppose, to go back a step, there's there's a lot of things can be done right before you think about... Yeah, uh, that's just, true, just yeah. think about cluster flushing. Um, it's a big it is, investment. It is a big investment, and it's a more technology in the parlour, and if it's working right, it's brilliant, um, and it's it does the same thing all the time. But I suppose just back to the teeth spraying, um, if you think you milk a high cell cone cow, you bring on some of that milk and some of that bacteria onto the next cow, you leave it on, that, on, on the outside of that teeth, um, so you don't infect the cow there and then you leave the bacteria in the outside and then your next step then is to do a very good job post spraying or post dipping to try and kill that bacteria before it ever gets a chance yeah. to, to grow and colonize the teeth. So I think um, step one is to do a really good job post spraying. That's vital so, though. Yeah, that 15 mils per cow. So check are you using enough that you're using a good product with, um, with a good disinfectant and a good uh, emollient. And making sure you're getting the teeth coverage that you're actually killing the bacteria before before it ever gets a chance to grow on the teeth. Yeah. yeah. And next, I suppose the next step from that as regards routine then is either cluster cluster dipping or or cluster flushing. So you're actually, as you said, Don, flushing out the the bacteria, flushing out the milk before it ever gets a chance to get onto the next cow. Um. But I think doing your doing that basic job, which doesn't add to the there's no expense, doesn't add to the time milking really. Um. And you'll have better teat health as well if you have a good quality product so doing that job well and getting good teat coverage is, is critical yeah, yeah definitely definitely and Dan just finally now to bring us on to the dry period and the routine around the dry period so I suppose what I'd like to go through here is the data collection here so obviously dates are really important to be inputting and yeah. some people will dry off earlier and they'll put them all in then for the first of December but there yeah. could be cows in the herd that are dried off since the end of October or start of November type thing mm. Possibly, I suppose, we know that that's really important, but maybe we'll just move towards talking about the dry-off technique itself and how you'd go about it or what do you really, I suppose, advise to farmers? Because um, I'm very conscious it's a difficult thing to do. It's actually really hard in your hands and it's something that, you know, you can get wrong. Yeah. If you get it wrong, you it leads to such huge issues. So I usually say 10 cows if you're on your own. Yeah. Um, yeah. I kind of don't like to go above, above 20 anyway in one go. Yeah, I think, you know, it's 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 the consequences of getting it wrong, you know. The consequences are huge, the following lactation, like, and I think when you're so tired and looking forward to shutting down, you just shut them down as quick as you can, get rid of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Christmas is coming, yeah. <laughs> and out the gap, you know what I mean? And, like, God, you can pay an awful price for mm. it, you know, and I think it's, look, it's the lack of help is a big thing, you know, but structure in your head, like, you know, the scale of the setups as well, and selective coming into it. You add all these into the pot together, you know. Um, we just have to do more thinking about it because the antibiotics is covering up an awful lot of bad practices. 
there's no point saying any different it just is and we just won't get away with that now under the new system and like I think you know, look you, you look at you have to do your prep clipping the tails you know getting them ready drafting them out beforehand if you could by right you know that they're on a, a wind down diet coming to drying off we're talking about the utopian type of scenario but people have to start striving to this mm -hmm. you know so you're starting to wind down cows a week 10 days before you dry them off yeah. and and uh, and a diet of whatever straw silage straw whatever hey without binding you know like nutritionally keep them going but i think it's to help the bunches mm. of tins now i think you're right yeah. um i think look the bigger you look at Jana sullivan who's doing what sealing 450 cows out of 500 and he does no more than 10 at any damn time. He's 500 cows. Yeah. So he, said, I'd like, he said it himself, I'd love to do 30, 40 of them, but I'm only going to do 10. Mm. So, like, just because, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of big herds out there and they say, oh, uh, 10 a day, it'll take me a while to drive <laughs> off. Yeah, yeah. But even if you've more help lined up to do that. And I, I think the 10 is, what I see at farm level, is that you put 20 cows into one row, the length of time they're standing there, they get so agitated, they're dunging, and that uses it's broken their routine. Number one, they hate coming back a second time anyway. Not a mind to say being waiting there again. They know something's wrong. <laughs> and they get agitated, don't they? Like, you know, you put your ten in and you get in and out, job done. Yeah. You know? And I know we spoke before as well, you know, maybe just drawing them that week or two earlier and having them still out on a bare paddock rather than yeah. inside and right. going down onto cubicles and just taking the hit on the on the milk yeah. and just leaving them go and it's drawing off those those better cows earlier. Yeah. Um, and getting them those milky know, type those cows, milky yeah. type cows that's and right. just yeah. on a safer area I suppose yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah no yeah I think this, you often hear it from I suppose herd owners with, with milkier type cows that they really Struggle. you know that's, that's, that's something that really um, exercises their mind coming up to dry off that they just can't reduce them down or it's too much punishment on the cow to reduce them down so I think you're right Mary if you can get them out because if you think of it a cow if she bags up after drying, drying off which a lot of them will and then it's to lie in a cubicle, so she's confined into a cubicle space. Her back leg has to come up, which puts more pressure in the bag. So if she can go off and lie down and throw herself out, it's going to be less pressure and less chance of leaking. And then if she does leak, she's out in the field um, and not, not inside in the cubicle. So yeah. Um, it's definitely something to consider. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose, look, should the technique, you know, you're looking at head torch, double glove. I find a double and two gloves and um, buy a new gown. To yes. be there for next spring. <laughs> <laughs> Get yourself an early Christmas present. Jack O'Connor might be able to sort us out with guns. Might be, yeah. <laughs> you just got in there ahead of me, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort something. The pressure's yeah. on there, Jack. But Don, you were saying the last time as well, you know, even the value of gloves, like uh, what box of gloves? Is it 20 quid for under? So if you're double gloving, yeah. you know, 40 yeah. quid will nearly do 100 cows. It's very cheap for. Yeah considering what you're what you're actually doing and how meticulous you have to be when you are doing it so in the big scheme of things it's very small the other point as well is you know even for the farmer the person that's at, that is going to dry off make sure that you're not in a rush you know oftentimes as well you see that i'm rushing away after milk and trying to get finished up but mm. you know go and have your supper even if you have to or if it's if it's in the morning get something quick to eat and really kind of separate that from milk and mm. it's a different it's a different activity it's mm. a different procedure altogether so yeah and turn off the bone the phone and if a tube falls it's yeah, gone it's gone mm, yeah totally. it is it is mm. that and like i i think the mets and cotton wool i see on over park at it you know they have the small fellas that break up the balls of cotton wool yeah. 50 or 60 in a bag mm. pour in your liter of cotton wool into it and like the wipes are great too but you know you're trying to open them they're yeah, just too they're finicky, too finicky yeah. you know and they're too difficult in when you're in the heat of battle as they say yeah. <laughs> but um and yeah. to saturate the teeth ends, you really do need the, the methylated look, spirits up look. on it and kind of really... And look, I think, look, wipe from the head and tube from the tail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, fellas get confused about mm -hmm. what way do I do it? If you wipe from the head, front left, front right, back right, back left, and tube from the back, from the tail, back left, you know... I know, it's trying to keep it as simple as possible, like, but... That could be know. the name of the podcast. <laughs> <That's a good laughs> <one. Yeah. laughs> Why from the head and tube? I've never heard that. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I'd be trying there. to say, oh, start at, the, start at the back and start at, no, start at the front and uh, go to the back. No, yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, that's say, brilliant. If I do the tube every yeah. quarter, I do this, and they get all confused. Yeah, or clockwise, just... anti-clockwise, yeah. and they're trying to think, yeah. yeah. And um, a sealer then, I suppose, a sealer is vital. Now, we, we can see really where the benefits lie in, in having having a sealer there. Some yeah. cows that keratin plug just will never form properly again, and it just really gives that barrier. Yeah, geez, I, when I started in, in practice, tis, 
this is a good while ago now, just 20 years ago now, but <laughs> sure 20 year reunion this year, but <laughs> I remember like uh, my first few years, like the amount of E. coli, E. coli mastitis, E. coli yeah. mastitis, uh, was, and then sealers came in around that same time sealers came in and as more people started sealing, the E. coli's went down. So there's no, I've no, I've no data to back that up, only my own data out in the road, but mm. Um, but I thought the trend was really was really clear. The more people sealed, the more the coli's went down. Yeah. Um, so it wiped out trichomastitis, didn't it? It did. Yeah, In fairness, it did. Like and it really reduced the coli, which yeah. which is a form of trichomastitis yes, because it yeah. came from the dry period. You know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's um it's absolutely vital. Yeah. I think just on one point, Dennis made a great point there about checking the teeth of the cows. You know, it's the one time you're going to look at all the teeth of the cows and like keeping a mental record or some kind of a record of. How the teeth ends are at drying off. Yeah, it's a good thing to do, you know, because if you can say, look, I'm sure I know there's fat deal in my hundred cows and damage, you know, take a few pictures and stuff that mm. you can talk to your vet about or so forth, then you can have a chat with the technician or see what the hell is going on because yeah, you know, because that can be just an underlying um problem. So you could be doing everything very well, yeah. and if there's teeth and damage coming from maybe over milking or an ACR not working right or or something, you know, and if you if, if that teeth and damage or cows stressed coming into the parlour and not letting down the milk, so there's there's a lot of reasons, but if you can identify it that it's there and put a solution in place, if you've healthy teeth ends like my god it goes a long ways to yeah. the it's the natural barrier that a cow has, the natural physical yeah. barrier and if they're if they're healthy, um do you know cows were well able to look after themselves a long time before before we came along. So if we can if we can work with them and keep keep their keep them healthy uh, and keep their teeth ends healthy, I think we can go a long way. Very good point. But we were talking about groups drying off, and there's people listening to us, and we say 10. But look, do 10 and bring in another 10, and bring in another 10. Do you know what I mean? That you can take a break, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you can recharge the batteries. Don't be putting 40 in or 20 in. Mm-hmm. You know Two rows either side, 20. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like, we're not saying 10 and go away off and it's taking us the month to do them. Do 10 and bring in another 10 and do another 10. So you can... Clean down your stands. You wash down. can wash down. You can recharge the battery. What went right? What went wrong? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you restock know, up with your equipment. Exactly. Change your gloves. Uh, change your gloves. Get everything ready again. Exactly. Go again. Go yeah. again. Yeah. yeah. You can yeah. feed, and you know, that's. And I definitely think if you're on sealer only, the owner does the sealer only. Mm-hmm. Don't be passing that responsibility <laughs> onto the, <laughs> on to the <laughs> workers yeah. or yeah. the helpers. No, yeah. look, if they're prepared, they would do it, let them do it. <laughs> Something I often wonder, Dan, you know, if, if you have two people, yeah. are you better off to work separately or as a team? Yeah. I, 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 the team, I think, Dennis, is a good... Mm. It's a good... I, I, I suppose everyone's different. So I, separately, uh, you've always got someone to play. Of course, you have to get on with the yeah. person. That's the first thing. That's but, yeah. 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 But yeah, I, I think the team that you can actually work very efficiently. Like yeah. you take, you know, if you take one teeth, um, sanitize it with your yeah. with your surgical spirits, tuber, sealer, move on to the next one. Yeah. You know that yeah. you can actually if if um if the things are being handed to you, you can actually work very very quickly if you do have help. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And you often find there too, as you know, when you're drawing off a coat and if you can keep contact with them, yeah. They yeah. won't get agitated. Yeah. yeah. Whereas if you have to go away, get another tube, mm. they come yeah. back, they're more likely to kick you. You know what I mean? Whereas yeah, yeah. if you can keep touch and somebody's handy to you in your yeah. hand and after you go tube, yeah. Mash it as it up, sealer, yeah. pinch it, move on to the next one. And you're keeping contact with them. Yeah. Do you know, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. The yeah. It's different. They might kick the bit the first time, but yeah. once you have it... When, yes. They, and you're not letting go. Yeah, you're not letting go. We actually did a bit on that last year. And then move on to the next and one. we kind of yeah. describe yeah. one person as the veterinary surgeon and the veterinary assistant as such, or the surgeon and assistant. Yeah. And literally, the assistant's there with the bag of cotton buds, hand in the correct tube, but there's no you know, direct contact with that person with the cow. They're actually just keeping everything flowing mm-hmm. for the person that is head torch and fully focused on yeah. the task yeah. at hand and they don't forget which is which one which yeah. teeth am I on and we yeah. at the front or yeah. at the back so yeah. 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 if you do have help yeah, and if you can and get help over maybe the next yeah. tender comes Absolutely. in stop over yeah. 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 and give your hands a rest it is it is tough on the hands yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a great yeah. thing with the team you yeah. can swap over like. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And I suppose the other thing just to mention in is recording um, yeah. yeah so good good accurate recording and mark them to make sure that they won't there'll be no mistake they won't arrive into the fowler that evening or something yeah no, it's cru- It's critical to um to record your dry off dates really, really accurately. I suppose and not be guessing yeah. them mm. and drawing in any dates. Yeah, like. and you've mentioned it a couple of times, Mary. And you know the accuracy of milk recording. So the milk recording will 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 record on the day, but then to, to the other recordings, the the calving yeah. date should be fairly right. In mm. fairness, but the dry off date, mm. like if if you don't record a dry off date, the milk recording reports they'll automatically give you a date a month after the last milk recording. 
But as you said, Don, earlier on, if it is inaccurate, you're, it could be very... F- one code can get a huge boost and another code can be, mm. you know, can work really against mm. her. So um, even to just record them, um, whether it is an app on ICBF or whatever, but, you know, it feeds into the accuracy yeah. of, of the data down the line. So that's it, lads. I'd say we might conclude. Um, and to conclude, we might, maybe I'll just get you to summarise <coughs> the three, probably our two or three important aspects of milk recording and why it is so important that we continue to do it and that we you know get more farmers on board and do it and also for vets to and ag advisors to go out and pick up the reports and, and look at them and be able to interrogate the data so i might turn to you to first dennis um i suppose look sure my advice is is to get um to get help and assistance with the data because milk recording it is a lot of trouble to do it uh, it generates a lot of data and then if you're not using it you're not really getting the value and it, become, it can become frustrating. The people that enjoy milk recording almost look forward to the data. So they, they understand it. They've gone to the trouble of, of um, I suppose, getting help to understand it if they don't understand it. And then if you understand it, I think, um, you know, you almost look forward to the milk recording. You look forward to seeing what's coming and, and taking the actions afterwards. Great. And Dan, um, what would you say are the, the most important points, I suppose, to... With milk to recording. Look, people about milk I recording. think that you got to look at your business and look at what's coming down the tracks. We've selected Joico and we've the nitrates with the bending coming in. So there is a cap being put on the National Dairy Herd and we just got to identify these problem cows and get rid of them. And if it's a herd that we need to go and buy stock or it's a herd that we have good enough to breed from and there's herds that are way better than they thought they were and there's herds that aren't as good as they should be. But like Dennis said, you can make... But I, I, that's a big point Dennis makes. There's an awful lot of fellas and ladies milk recording that haven't a clue what the reports mean. So for God's sake, go way off and understand them. And if you're first time milk recording, make an appointment with Dennis and his team and un, or your advisor or whoever and learn the reports. And yeah. Pull the information out of them. Too yeah. many people haven't a clue what's inside them. Yeah, we like there's lots of help there. So uh, we offer a consult in the autumn to any any person that wants mm. it. It's milk recording that someone will sit down. One of our advisors will sit down and explain the report. If you're a taggish advisor, they're more than happy to, to go through it. If you're a vet, that's more than happy to go through it. So there's there's uh, you might even help a few people out, Mary. But uh, <laughs> and but, the more you go through them, that's what I find, yeah. and it just gets more interesting yeah. every time as well. It you'll does, find something yeah. new because they're huge. They're huge reports. You yeah. you'll, you won't cover everything in in a in the first visit or the first call or anything. No, I think but, I think understanding it is the key because if you understand it, the, the data comes to life exactly. then and you start using it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that concludes our final episode in the Other Health podcast series. I'd like to thank our guests today, Don Crowley and Dennis Howard. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And also our host, Mary O'Connor with MSD Animal Health. We hope you've enjoyed this and tune in again soon to listen to our next podcast series. Mm-hmm.